How's it going, everybody? This is once again King Hippo joining you for the Slips and Hippo Show. I'm King Hippo, and of course, I'm always joined by my broadcast colleague. Yo. Thank you. I was waiting for that. Oh, I thought you were going to say my name. <laughs> no, no, no. You're there. You can speak. Okay. Allegedly. I don't know about that. Um, so lots to talk about this week. You know, we obviously, we had a new um, combat cast that was on Valentine's Day. We'll introduce a new character. We'll talk about that. It's also a big announcement of the Beyond the Summit, which is a popular sort of, uh, I would say, a general esports initiative that has taken a glance over at um, Mortal Kombat 11. So we'll be talking about that. And we'll talk about some Twitter drama because we all know that's probably why you're here. Uh, get some comments on what has been going on lately with that. And then I have an interesting topic I want to talk about with Slips with that we'll end the show with. Um, but I did want to, before we start, I did want to give a little bit of a, a birthday shout out. Slips' birthday was this past week. He turned oh. four, 47. Yep. 47 years young. <laughs> You're about 10 years over the limit, but or over the accuracy point. Oh, but. okay. Might as well be. He I looks just, like a finely aged Koopa Troopa. Yeah. It was uh it was a good birthday. I spent it driving. I went to Pennsylvania to visit family. Mm. It was a long drive. I actually got stranded in the Appalachian Mountains. In the because mountains. Because I mean it snowed hellas. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I'm not driving through mountains on icy roads, like I'm good. So, it's probably smart I got stranded idea. for a couple days. Now, when like, you say when stranded, with family and like the kid, like their like their kid, like doesn't have school, like because it's so much snow, like you know, snow day. Yeah, it's a snow day. So you know it's bad then. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I was like, well, sh- damn, like they didn't even have school, so I ain't about to drive ten hours. <laughs> now, now let's be clear. When you say stranded. Do you mean you were stranded at your relative's place of residence, or you were literally str- like I'm in my car at like a rest area and I don't want to move anywhere? Stranded in my relative's residence. Oh, okay. Because when you said I was I was trapped in the Appalachian I made it Mountains, sound way that more makes it sound like that I you know, needed to, 27 yeah. hours. Like I expect you to come up with half a limb. <laughs> not, not you're like oh it was a that comfortable been house. You know, a much cooler story if I got stranded on the side of the road and. I was getting buried under snow. Yeah, that's that's what I expected. I had to, to like tie a shirt to and make a rope out of it and climb a, a cement wall or something. Well, now That'd it definitely cool. sounds like you would have died. I made it, man. <laughs> so he's made, made it through his adventure alive and well. Uh, that's good to hear. Uh, Slips is uh, even though he's older, he's hanging in there. He's giving us uh, him and like you know Ryan Hart and. Sako, give hope to us all that we can be old and washed up, but still good. <laughs> it's pretty fun. I can do well. Yeah, it's, it's high praise. I do all right. Yeah, he does. He does all right. That's why we keep him around. Uh, so let's just get right into it. So the combat cast happened on Valentine's Day. We were once again joined by Tyler Lansdowne and Steve Brownback and Derek Kurtzik. Uh, to talk about a brand new character that was real that was Jade returning from Mortal Kombat 9. Uh, what did you think first of just seeing Jade back for the first time in a while? Uh, I've gotten... I mean, she looks great. She looks cool. I, I have never really cared about Jade because she beat the crap out of me. What was it, Mortal Kombat 2? 2, she was a hidden... She, she was, was really, the easiest hidden character to run was, into. She beat argue. the crap out of me yeah. so bad in that game. And then when Mortal Kombat 3 came out, she was even worse. She was probably the cheapest, one of the cheapest AIs I've ever seen was freaking Mortal Kombat 3 Jade. I always felt that way, but I never knew if it was just me. Gosh, man, like, cause you just want to throw a projectile, man. And then you can't do that. You, can, you can't do anything. <laughs> like, all you can do is that jump in combo thing. Yeah. Like, that's literally the only thing you can do. So, I mean, she's cool. She looks awesome. She looks cheap. She, you know, who she, she reminds me of Who's that? is uh, Doomsday. Doomsday. Where wow. She dominates the neutral, but she's kind of low damage. That's what I look at it. 
That's an interesting comparison. Not the first one I probably would have went with, but I could see what you're talking about. Um, as for me, I I agree. Like, I've never thought Jade was that cool. Like, I think it's – obviously, I think, you know, like, aside from green being, like, one of my favorite colors, I think she's, like, the definition of all right. Like, glow, <laughs> glow right. is a cool move. But other than that, I never really felt like she had much of an identity. Like, because, you know, in MK9, she literally holds the staff in her hand. But I want to say she had, like, two or three moves that actually used the thing. Mm-hmm. It was, like, her up three, and she had, like, a uh, uh, kind of a, right. a slam with the staff. But other than that, she didn't really use it all that much. So I was, and in MK3, it's, like, in her, like, because, you know, everyone character has, like, those legitimate dial combos. It, it's there, but you don't really, you don't really use it other than that. I always thought it was weird. And then it wasn't until the 3D games where you could actually use it as a weapon, but. She just has no backstory. We don't really know anything well, we, about her. Well, we kind of do. She's one of Katana's longtime friends and is also, you know, she lives in the living forest and stuff like that. But Super I agree. With, beyond that, we don't know a whole, a whole lot. But so now... She, something she, cool needs to happen with her. Where'd, well, she learn think, how, where'd she learn how to use that stick? And where did Katana learn how to use fans? Who yeah, let's, like, let's get some lore on her. Like, she's her friend, so she's just awesome as well. Like, I mean, that makes sense. Come on, like, where does she learn all this stuff? We need and some... Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, like, we just don't know anything. Like, you know, we know all about Scorpion and, you know, Sub-Zero and Liu Kang. Like, you know, that's why they're some of the favorites, because we know so much about them. But, I mean, yeah, Jade's is kind of there. Yeah. So, she, I mean, And she's been cool. sporadically in the games. Um, like, she was in Deception and... Since that she hadn't been in a game since MK3 at that point, so she kind of hops around. And then in MK2, right, she's right. more of a hidden character, so it's not like she's really in the game. Um, in MK9, she died a horrible death. Yeah, uh, Sindel, along with half the cast, fucked. She's them like all the up. good, ver- good guy, good side version of Baraka. It's no, like, I would. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, so it's like she's almost like. A cat, like kind of a geek, cannon, but, like yeah. cannon fodder almost. Yeah, like, like kind uh, of, a, yeah, a geek, but you know, a good-hearted geek. Right. Like Striker. Right, 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 right. I well, she's back um, now. She does have a little bit of an interesting look to her. She is like zombified in her default look, or uh, what do they call them? Revenants. So her skin's all dark and her eyes are glowing because hmm. she did die, and she was right. in MKX, you know, as a revenant. Um, although in MKX, they they did have Katana had a variation that was Jade ish. Where she had like right. the 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 glaive, the, the glaive, and I think she had some like move with the staff, but like it was right. not a great take on Jade. This isn't really like what people, you know, really thought Jade. You know, if Jade, you could dial down to the glaive, I guess. But no, she's back um, with all of her moves that you might remember. So you have the glow, um, the shadow kick, which is like a glowing green kick. Got not dissimilar to Johnny Cage's. Uh, exactly. And, exactly. And her, she uses her staff like quite a bit. Uh, That's which, good. So yeah, so which seems to be, as Steve pointed out on the stream, kind of their mo going forward is that they want characters that have had weapons in the past really just use them all the time, and they're not because you know a lot of characters. And he pointed out Baraka as an example, and Jade, and even Scorpion. You know, they have these weapons clearly on their persons at all times, but they never really used them. Like Cabal is, you know, he's got the hook swords, but he really only used them for a few moves. Mm-hmm. Most of it was punching and kicking. And so I guess in this one, they decided that, well, if they have weapons, they're going to darn well use them. So it's kind of cool. Now Jade has, you know, a large majority of her moves use the staff and her normals do too. So she's using that staff all the time, which I think is pretty neat. Yeah, they're all. The, uh, it's curious oh, that uh, I wonder how far they'll go with the weapons. When like, I wonder if Jax is in the game and he just has like submachine guns as normals. Like, <laughs> well, to be fair, he's got giant metal arms. <laughs> like, those awesome. are the. I mean, his weapons are the giant arms. He's that he doing has. gun katas. That would be fun though. Like we we <laughs> had like you know they have like a like Harley Quinn and like uh, Deadshot. I guess they have used guns in their normals, but we haven't really in MK gotten that far with like. Man, the character cool. who uses all guns. <laughs> I think it's a good. Yeah, I think it's good. I'm the more of that, the better. Like we we went over that last time. I think they they always talk about how they're experts and martial arts experts with X weapon and yeah, they never use them. They just right, right. Well, and they also like a change. Like Scorpion in 
you know, like an MK3, you know, when he's in new MK3, like, doesn't he use, like, axes? Yeah. Yeah, like, just his, like, random That's axes. That's right. That's right. And then in later games, he had the Super sword. Super random. Super yeah. random. And then in later games, he used a sword, but he'd only right. use it in a few different moves. And now they're incorporating the spear as a large part of his, you know, That's cool. Set, which is I cool, like yeah. And, you know, Sub-Zero is using a variety of different ice weapons. Master of the Kunai, and all he ever did was one move, yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty masterful to throw that thing. That's impressive. I guess, yeah. yeah sure. I, yeah, he's he's doing all right. Baraka oh, yeah. using his blades a lot. Because, again, that's a weird one where he had some specials that used them, but for the most part he did punches and kicks. Right. Where he's got those blades, he might as well put them to use. Justifies that, too. I always thought that was, like, absurdly cheap. That he had those arm blades, like, with yeah. Mortal Kombat 2. I was yeah. like, that's ridiculous. I, I want to say his, his back, his back close punch was like a blade swipe but that was pretty much it and you know the blade spark you know move that he had but other than that he didn't really use them which i always thought was weird yeah it just kind of will johnny cage have nunchucks <laughs> well i think there's certain characters that don't have to have weapons or uh, Liu kang yeah like Liu kang doesn't have to i mean we've already seen sonya doesn't have a weapon per se she has that robot okay yeah, gears doesn't have a weapon but the ones that do, you know, they'll use it. So that's kind of cool. True. Uh, we saw a little bit of how Jade's going to operate. So it seems like the type of moves she has that are available is like, uh, there's a bunch of projectile options. So there's, you know, straight projectile, the glaive, where it kind of spins around her and goes out on the screen. The one where she throws it upwards at an angle. There's another one where she throws it down in the air diagonally. And then she has a low kind of a wave move, kind of like, Donatello's move in Tournament Fighter. It's like a wave, green wave thing and she shoots out and it hits low. It's just a <laughs> bunch of projectile options. And we saw Steve use that pretty effectively. Like, uh, between all of them, it was kind of hard to escape uh, her just doing that. And then she has Glow to complement that, so it's like, even though, in the, you know, in Mortal Kombat, projectiles don't clash, so they go through you, it seems like she can avoid that kind of that's true. Yeah, she'll be able to avoid that kind of chicken game of, you know, we're hitting each other with projectiles, and it's like, who's recovering faster to do another one? Well, she doesn't have to play that game. Well, yeah, one of the iconic things in Mortal Kombat 3 was her instantly activating it and then doing a projectile to win all the trades as right. the AI. Right, so so her being able back. to do that is, is very iconic. So yeah, that is it's true cool. to the character, I, like I would say, yeah. Yeah, I like that. <clears throat> um, but that's not all she has. Uh, where they went through a couple different moves that she has. She has a weird like kind of command run that she can right. stop, and it leads to either a grab-type move or a, a staff slam of some sort. Uh, that's kind of neat. Uh, it's the only run in the game, and they said it was going to be one of the only run options in the game, so that's kind of neat that she has that specifically. Because right. I think... Well, I think also it's kind of like a lot of people would think like, oh, her glowing up and running at me. That's kind of what she did in Mortal Kombat 3. I remember. That's what I remember. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's a shout out to that too. Yeah. That's interesting. I, we don't know if that combination works. I guess it does because it wasn't, they showed it to us. Yeah, like, well, as far and, as the and, slots and. Yeah, well, and that, yeah, that would depend. That like that, stuff. that might, that thing might be two, two slots. Which means that you got, you know, okay, we're going to use this to take up a couple slots, but you, that's all you get. You, you don't get to have all the projectile options. You only get this one, you know, this one move. Right. So that's interesting. Um, the other thing they showed was that she had a, uh, it was like a, a counter, like a parry, where she kind of mm -hmm. put her arm out, and so she then was able to counter uh, a move that you did. It's kind of more of a standard parry, but it looked cool. Right. She, like, teleports in place. Uh, there was also one where, like, her shadow kick, if you amplify it, she goes behind you and hits you with the staff. But there was one where you amplified it, and it was on, it was kind of like the, the version of it that was an MK9, where it hit you twice and moved you back across the screen, on the, but on the same side. So there's an option for not swapping sides with it, which I guess, you know, that could be useful. If you, did, right. if you wanted to zone more and you didn't want to swap sides and be closer. I thought that was cool. So she she has a, it seems like mostly she's going to be oriented around throwing projectiles, but she's got a couple other unique sort of options that if you want to play around with her and maybe be more aggressive, you could do that too. 
Mm-hmm. So that was Jade. Um, and then Oz, as usual, we got the, uh, the washed up warriors fight. This was Steve and Ken. This time they were playing as a uh, Baraka and Jade. And we got to see a little bit more of Baraka. He had, uh, this flag move that we hadn't seen previously where he, he, cause we haven't seen it before. He plants this flag and he gets like a damage boost. Mm-hmm. Now he got this thing where he picks the flag up and he charges after you and he's got armor while he's doing that. Hmm. And the move looked pretty safe. Like it had a huge pushback. And he had armor as long as he held the flag. I think it was only one hit, but still. And we saw Ken use this a lot. Sort of to just gain some ground while Jade was zoning him out, which I thought was pretty cool. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, So he has a way to charge it. He also has like a... It was like Berserker Barrage, which is Wolverine's like claw move in the the versus games. Like he just hits you a bunch with his claws or his blades, which I thought looked cool. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that was another tie set between Steve and Ken. It ended on... Uh, we saw Baraka, a new fatality from him, which was cool. Uh, where he slices your head in two and skewers both parts. That was uh, gross, but cool. I enjoyed that. And we saw that between those two, um, kind of what we talked about last time, where those two use jump kicks a lot. Mm-hmm. Way more than jumping punches. Which again leads me to believe that jumping kicks kind of like in, cause this was, it was kind of like that in MK9. I think like a common, um, belief about MK9 was that, oh, it was super easy to anti air anybody. Like you had a dedicated, you know, way to anti air something. And I, I think there's a little bit of a, it's not quite accurate. I think what would happen is that jumping punches weren't, didn't hit good enough as a frontal attack a lot of times to be a very effective, unless they were doing it on a cross-up. But jump kicks were always really good and hard to hit, you know, someone out of. There's a reason Steve went so long doing very well doing jump kick fan a lot. It was a hard move to stop, you know, and uh, I think a lot of characters use jump kicks really effectively, especially if they had an air attack like Cabal did, uh, like Katana did. And so what it seems like is jump kicks are really good, and but the jump and punches aren't going to be as effective as a jump in frontal attack. So what a lot of what they were doing a lot of times was waiting for the jump kicks to come out and outspacing each other so you could punish the landing recovery. So we saw Ken do that a lot with Baraka, um, where he would use sweep or he'd use that low string starter to punish the recovery of Jade's jumping attacks. Jade could do something similar because she had long range moves. And that was kind of the space that we're playing at once it got a little bit closer. Obviously, Baraka wanted to be in a little bit closer because he could do chop chop and things like that. Jade wanted to be out a little more. We saw a lot of use of wake up roll from Ken, uh, which put in the mind game of whether or not Steve wanted to stop and punish it or let it go. So that was fun to see. Uh, we Jade has we saw her wake up attack, which is a long kind of s- swing with her staff, which looked kind of cool. And other than that, I would say it was. You know, another good showing of kind of what the game might pan out between two more knowledgeable players. Mm-hmm. I thought that was good to watch. And then we had the belt battle, of course. And they had a stipulation. So there was two stipulations. One was where Steve played it for Derek, which is bullshit. And then there was another one where they were supposed to play blindfolded, but they had them both put blindfolds on, and then Tyler took his off to beat Derek. Definitely Dude. hoodwinked him. But it was good fun. And that was the combat cast for this week. So we saw a little bit more Baraka. We saw the reveal of Jade. We won't have another one this week. It, this this week is a mobile one for the Mortal Kombat mobile. But they will have another one in another another week. Uh, and it seems so far we're kind of getting a good clip of information about new characters. Uh, we got about roughly two months before the game comes out. So as if they keep this pretty steady, we'll see a bunch of the characters and we'll get a good, a good pretty good breakdown of what's going on mm-hmm. so if you don't you can watch that on i'm sure someone's stolen it and uploaded it to youtube at this point yeah you can watch, watch it now yeah there you go <laughs> we don't support theft folks uh the other big news that came out during the week was that uh beyond the summit which is an organization that Hosts a sort of, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it, because I think a lot of people get the wrong idea about it. While there is a tournament aspect or a round robin, kind of kumite, I think that's the right word, kumite like set up to the whole thing, it really is more of a celebration of like 
a game and like the people that play it. Uh, there's a lot of like shenan- because it's like a th- basically a three day weekend in a house in a big house with a bunch of people. So it's a reality show, yeah. Basically, it's like the yeah. Madden show. Kind of, yeah, like the mat. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Right. So you'll see they'll you know put in like Mafia Two or whatever and race, and they'll make a competition out of that. They'll play Mario Party, right? You know, a bunch of fun stuff, and then they'll do you know one of the last days is around Robin, and it is a, a good intense competition, but it is ultimately more about having a fun time with people who they might tune in to play, and how it's kind of worked in the past is that they'll pick like seven or eight people that they have like specific invites for. And then they might have a couple slots open where they do it. So kind of crowdfunded. So you vote for who you want in by essentially paying out for merchandise from them. Uh, usually it's like branded hats and stuff like that, water bottles. And that way you kind of get into the summit by kind of almost like a donation, but like kind of like when Evo did that thing where they used, it was like who donated the most got to be in. Mm hmm. That is how it works, but we don't know the exact specifics. We know so that we, we know it was announced, and that it seems like they said coming soon. So it kind of seems like it'll be it'll be something happening around the time of the release. So it's going to be sooner rather than later. There was a lot of controversy about who might be in it, though. So on Twitter, I I had heard some rumblings, and I what I had heard did not sound good. But the consensus appears to be and I'll pull it up right now that so it's it's a it's a list I think that makes sense generally like I don't I don't hate it so here's a here's the presumed list of people that are invited so it's we got Sonic we got Dragon DJT Chris G Tyrant King Hayate Tekken Master Foxy and Scar all right. Uh, it's certainly not a, a bad list because the one I saw didn't have any international players and it had like Justin Wong and a few other dudes on there. And I was just like, oh, that's, well, that's no good. It's an eye roller. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Chris G is probably the one, like if you were to, like, I think if you were to like reasonably think, because to me the, there's some weird exclusions. Like I think Honeybee, is, it's weird that he's not on there just because yeah. – he, he kind of has a, a thing going with his own brand, his own personal brand. Yeah. And that's exactly the kind of thing they'd be looking for. Right. Honeybee or bio, I guess, or both. So I thought that was a weird exclusion. Like, I, I guess if you had to kick off one, like Chris G would be the one. Uh, also, just because it's Chris G. I guess Chris G and Tyrant were the two out because uh, – I don't know. I don't know if Tyrant. I don't remember the last time Tyrant's like played in a tournament or entered one. Or well, I'd see I'd see him enter MKX ones, but I think aside from maybe a couple, he didn't really just he just didn't really you know show up. Right, really and then he, I don't. I didn't see him anywhere around Justice. Justice two, not at. I don't <clears throat> like maybe maybe so the that online was, stuff. That I, one. I that one. I was like, huh. Yeah, uh, and Chris G. I mean, I just haven't really seen him play an NRS game since. I mean, I guess Justice. the first, it's first injustice. First injustice but was the last. time. He wasn't really MKX or MK or Injustice Two either, like Tyrant. So those two were. I was like, huh, but all the the rest of them I thought were great. Yeah, I think that's a fine. Otherwise, it's a fine list of people. But uh, someone certainly wasn't very happy about it, and that someone was Tweety, who went on a. I guess the only thing I could say is a Twitter rampage. Like he was real, real upset about it, <laughs> and uh, he, he was talking about. Yeah, I mean, unlike the last two we just talked about, he has been around for MKX and Injustice too. That is true. So I under, like that. Uh, yeah, I think he's got a, a, a sound reasoning to sound off about that. I definitely think there is a there is some. Definitely legitimacy to it, or validity. And, and Honeybee, like, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, I would say there's some, there's definitely validity to what he's talking about. the The way he went about it, I, I kind of don't agree with. Uh, well, the, he said for some reason that like, oh, they're gonna invite people like Sherry Genix instead, and it's like, I, well, they're not. <laughs> that's a weird. Okay, that's a weird. And she immediately called him out on that. Like, why would you say me? Like, there's no way. 
<laughs> and then he was saying, like, well, that was just me, you know, generalizing. And shit. Like, well, don't do funny. that. <laughs> and that spun off into a bunch of horse shit. Because <clears throat> then a bunch of people were weighing in. So you had, like, Rick, the guy who, Rick Thier, I think that's how you say his last name, who hosts Combo Breaker. He weighed in and tweeted, so said he's been a hater since day one, which makes no sense. Uh, Combo Breaker is one of the friendliest of all tournaments to these type of games and stuff like that. So that was really weird. Alex Valle came in there. Uh, hey, I didn't see any of this. Yeah, and then I, they might have been deleted for all I know. I'm not actually sure, but I remember seeing as it had happened live, kind of like you would watch a car tr- uh, you know, a car crash. No kidding. Valle came in, but Valle's advice was the more condescending, annoying kind, where it was like... Uh, He's talking about, oh, well, your brand's not good enough. you got to get a better brand. But everyone says that, but no one actually says how you do it. Because it's always the same people. You notice it's kind of the same people get the same opportunities. So that was kind of annoying. And then I'm trying to think. Of, a lot of people had a lot of opinions, basically. But at the end, it boiled down to Tweety was pissed that he really didn't get a slot. And now I guess he felt like he wasn't going to get a slot because people took him out of context, and now they hate him. And... No one would vote him in, and I, it's. <laughs> I, I I would say the reason why Tweety didn't get in is he's probably the producers and the douchebags of the TV industry were probably like well, he's well, not, the, he's, the weird... he, they probably looked at him just like he's not camera friendly, and they were just like, oh he, my god, that's harsh, like Jesus, dude, what like. He's a bigger guy. They're probably like, oh, let's get someone else or something that's, like that. That's super. That's not it. Come on. That's. You know. Oh, I don't think. Well, because this isn't like a TV. This is TV. TV. This is TV. It's, it's, it's not. It's not televised. This is. Uh, uh, it's not uh, televised? No. It's a group of people that do it on Twitch. Oh. <laughs> Jesus, so man. No, so there's no TV. I thought this was like a TVS thing or something. I mean. So it's not. <laughs> Tweety's been on Disney XD. Like, that, is, that wasn't a problem. Like, Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Dude, you, have to, you have to apologize to Lord I, Okay, I apologize. Thank you. Now we can move on. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, so it was, it was, it was that, big... That's the only... But the, the thing is, that's the only thing I could think of as the, to the reason of why I didn't get in. It's not well, because... Okay, of, no, I, it's I, not I, like I, I'm like, oh, it's really... I, I can think of a few reasons. I can think of it's a few like, reasons. There's, I literally can't, like, it's a compliment to him. It's just like, I literally can't think of a reason sure. other than some superficial bullshit reason. By, by the way, what I a compliment this in. is. You're really good and you should have been in, but you know what? I think, uh, you know, aesthetically speaking, uh, you get the fuck out of here. Like, that, that's not a compliment. Other than that, he's perfect. He's right. really good. He I, talks shit. He's funny. Uh, like, I don't understand why he would be in. If that was the only thing I could think of. I was like, oh, well, maybe they just don't think he'll look good on TV. <laughs> but it's not on TV, so I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I can I, I think of a I'm couple reasons. I I'm, can think of a I'm, team, I'm on Team Tweety. All right, all right. Well, I can think of a couple reasons, just to play devil's advocate. Okay. I think, one, I think sometimes, like, so it, it appears to be that Compton, who you may know, who he used to run the... EGP locals in in SoCal, really nice dude. He got a job with ESL eventually, so he he helped. He would help do some of those ESL um, events, and it seems it appears to be that he is involved in the production of this one. And and this sounds fucked up, and I'm not trying to throw him under the bus or nothing, but it, I, I think that it might be one of those things where he 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 kind of picked who he thinks should be in it, but he may not. He may not be as up to code on who you know who should be in, because then that would explain the tyrant pick. Who, like I said, tyrant, I'm sure would be good. Like it's not like he's not going to be. I, like I'm sure if he played dedicated his time to it, he'd be good. Oh yeah, nothing it's nothing about fire. that. Yeah, it's more he's of just okay. Best, like he's been in some of the best matches in Interest history. In the, in the yeah, absolutely. He's and I think, stud. but I think then if you know you're kind of picking in that sense in your head spaces that in that sort of in that way, then you might not think of Tweety because. Well, you weren't thinking about Injustice 2. You were thinking about the past. and I could see that. So that's reason number one. He does have some of the most memorable matches. Him and Chris G. So, Yeah. Reason number two 
I could see. Yeah, and Christy, Christy uh, for you know all his faults, did have a pretty extensive history in MK9 and in Justice One. Yeah. Uh, so, and then the other thing is, I would say, while Tweety's personality is funny on Twitter, like I have a blast reading that shit. I don't like for the atmosphere that the summit tends to go for, which is very laid back. You know, they're having fun, but it's it's or they're 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 shit talking each other, but it's all kind of in the name of fun. I'm sure Tweety's a nice fella in person, but the way he talks online, it sounds like he. Like he, he'd kind of just be uh, not a bully, but you know, uh, weird and standoffish. Now, as I said, that might just be an online, you know, thing. But like, for example, like Wonder Chef came in there, and I know you're a big fan of Wonder Chef. What? Yeah, you're a huge fan, right? Sure. On Team Chef, and he was saying something about how, like, I don't think you know your personality is very good, and then Tweety immediately rocked back with. Well, I've talked to you in person several times, and I think you're standoffish and weird. Like, it gets to that level very quickly, so I think... Wait, who said that? <laughs> so that was Tweety talking to Wonder Chef. He said Wonder Chef is standoffish and weird? Yeah, he just said that right out, right, right? <laughs> so, I, I think if you if you don't know any better, right? like, let's say you're working for this Beyond the Summit thing. All you really know is how they are online, right? Because you never met these people. Okay. You're working something. And you might look at something like that and go... Well, that's fine and dandy, you know, for, you know, a tournament or whatever, but we're, we're trying to promote as, you know, more of a, you know, people who are a little bit less confrontational and more friendly to each other than that. So let's not do that. I could see that how, if you didn't have any context beyond what you see, that you could make that decision. I can see that. Cause he's been like this for long. I mean, I could see that, time. but I would say that's. Dumb decision. I didn't say it was a good reason. I'm just playing devil's advocate and saying I could see this is these are reasons I can think. I would be like, this guy's great. I do. Get him I on do. The show. One thing I do <laughs> agree with that he brought up, and I did agree with was that I think a lot of times with the people that exclusively play NRS games, there has been historically a sense of that those if they do only play that game those games they are generally in the in the esports sense of like oh we're gonna put on a show and we need a big production sort of thought of as mouth breathers who don't really offer a lot so we need to get like remember when they did that what was it like um the fatal eight or whatever it was called when mkx was coming out and it was a few weeks before it came out Mm -hmm. and it had like sonic and i think tyrant was there and then it had like ryan hart yeah, that's right. Which, like, you know, Ryan Hart, prodigal son, great Tekken player, legendary Tekken player even. Even Street Fighter Four, he's very, very good at it. Right. Have you ever, I've never even heard him utter the words more, like, I don't even think I've begun to hear him say the words Mortal Kombat. But he's there because, you know, Ryan Hart, you're like, oh, that's, you know, that's someone. And, it was, it's weird, yeah, that was weird. Yeah, and, and he just kind of got washed and was out of there. And you knew he was getting paid. Because it's like, who? If you came up to me and and said, "Hey, we're gonna pay you to be in this little, uh, you know, competition pre-release in uh, Puzzle Fighter Five or something like <laughs> yeah, that," yeah, because that's a game that's coming out. I reference. They'd be like, they'd be like, "You're really good at like fighting games, and and you're good at games, right?" I'd be like, "Yeah." This, 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 what a, what a I, awesome conversation. I would be like the worst. Like, hey, are you are you good at games? Puzzle yeah. fight. Like, there's no way I would accept it. You know, I'd be like, if you're gonna give me money, I'll play for you. I don't. But personally, I would just be like, I I know that game, but I've never really like played it hard. I w- I wouldn't want to like take a spot to be like, yeah, let's play Puzzle Fighter. So you knew like he like he had to be getting paid. Like they had to be getting paid. It was just, it just made it look extra corporate when it when you see like yeah a Ryan Hart type or like a Justin Wallen like like the typical like esports mascot type. Yeah, well, and also I think the the part that kind of sucks is that you kind of know that like Ryan Hart is like already uh, like semi retired. Right. So it's like, okay, he's not going to be actively competing in tournaments for this. Not that he's a bad person, but at the same time, I really kind of don't think. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame him. Yeah. Like, that's I just, cool. 
Yeah, like, I just don't he, think the he'll... opportunity he was asked and he took it. Like I don't. Believe oh yeah, that. why would you not take it? Absolutely. Right, that's cool. But, but for me, just, but, but for the like, for us that like are into fighting games and we know the scene, like we we all know that's like kind of a bullshit. Like, like he's um, well, because uh, the other thing is I. <laughs> Yeah, I know. We we know what we're talking about. And right. I, I think the other thing is I, I've never – so I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert. I've never seen the data on these type of things like how they track viewers and all the statistics and stuff like that. I have I – just, I just happen to have a really hard time believing that in such a niche genre like this, it really, really – like they're like, dude, Ryan Hart's on the, on the marquee. We, we've got 10,000 viewers from that. Right. Like, I, I just, I really it was don't believe. purely a data driven drawing for him, yeah. Yeah, like, I just, I, again, I just, I really don't believe. No feel at all. Yeah, I, I really the don't believe. Or, <laughs> or just general, like, again, I don't, it, it may, like I said, I'm, I'm totally willing to be wrong. Like, if someone could immediately, like, pull out an Excel spreadsheet not related to Tech Mobile and just show me, <laughs> that's an inside joke, folks. If they could just show me, like, oh, these actually, like, Justin Wong being on there brings in 20,000 extra people. Well, right, right. Well, shit, right. I proved me wrong. But otherwise, I, I really, I just legitimately don't believe that the amount of people they draw in just by being there is worth, like, well, we could get, say, you know, Honeybee, but he's just a nobody. Let's get Justin instead. And, again, it's not a problem that Justin just kind of, you know, he plays a bunch of games. That's kind of his thing. He kind of focuses on the the biggest ones, but he does play the other ones. But it's not he doesn't take them as seriously as anyone, which is normal. That's not a problem. It, but it was just when they're out there to promote the game, and you know it's going to be a sort of a fair weather promotion. Uh, it, and you have people who would willingly promote the like who would willingly like play the game all the time and promote it. And you pick the people who, again, for branding purposes, make more sense than any sort of intuition. Then yes, I agree. It feels hollow and weird. Devil's Advocate, though, mm-hmm. the Justin Wongs, the Reinhardts, they do have a big following for just the casual FGC types. So seeing them play those games mm-hmm. does introduce a different audience to Mortal Kombat. So there's that. Well, and That's the what, bright side of it. But that was what I was saying before, where it's like I, I just empirically I don't believe the data shows that Justin Wong brand is drawing more than Mortal Kombat is to get people to play. Like, I don't like. Does their endorsement really? Because again, I've I've seen them endorse every game known to man. King of Fighters fourteen. Did that Twitter help at thing. all? What's that? <laughs> like, and yeah, like in Killer. I just said Killer Instinct. Um, well, Killer Instinct. Now, Killer Instinct did. Killer Instinct did benefit from having because those guys played for a while. I believe, if I recall correctly, the first Evo, like, Justin and, like, PR Balrog were in the top eight. Justin started off in MK9 doing well. He did. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Christy, obviously. Different did. time, though. It was a different time. I, and I think that is the other thing that maybe needs to be taken into equation here is that, ultimately, this community of players, despite what some people would say, is very young. Not young in the sense of actual age, but young in the sense of this has been an established game that's been playing at tournaments for a while. Like, in MK9 in 2011 was, like, the first real showing of this kind of game. And, it, and you know, obviously, they're you know, the community's young, and it's going to be taken over by those veterans who just know how to play games kind of faster than other people. But it's been eight years since then. And now, those kind of guys, as if they take it up, you know, at the beginning, they might, you know do okay here and there, but nowadays they don't really get that far. Like Chris G in like in MKX, I think the highest he ever got was like top 32 at the first Evo, which is good. But you know, in years past, he would get top eight easily. Right. It's just a different scene. Now the, the players are way more up to par. And I think a lot of more players are more aware of how to be a bigger personality. Cause I, the other thing I would agree with is that a lot of times the top players aren't like Sonic being the anomaly here personable a lot of those guys are not like like perfect legend has the personality of a moth you know, i wouldn't have him on you know like oh he's a really entertaining guy dragon who's a, a really nice kid 
he's just a guy for the most part. Like, and he doesn't have to be. I'm not saying that it's a flaw in their personality that they're not. It just is what it is, right? Um, you know, those they just don't have a lot of personality, so they feel like they need to be people who are more personable to to make up the slack of it. But I I think they're getting better at it. I think. And this is where the Tweety thing comes in, where that is a loud personality, bad or not, right? You could put that person in that, and it immediately would it would spark, you know, conflict and, and all the stuff that you want for a good, you know, program or a good tournament series. But they didn't do it, or they, again, this is, and I, I should note that this is an alleged list. I'm not saying this is fact. It could certainly change, but as far as we know, this is what it's going to look like, and I think there is a lot of times where that in, inferiority complex does it does ring true sometimes. Sometimes. Well, I, I think the problem with the whole Justin Wong, Reinhardt, like doing these types of things or those like old school, like legend Street Fighter Capcom guys, like branching off and playing other games to, and they say they're there to promote it and. And the, you know, the corporate side pretty much eats it up. And mm-hmm. the problem, I think, is that they stop playing those games. They don't keep playing them. They just play them for the promotion, for the money. And then two or three months later, they stop playing them. And then their their followers and the stream people, they ask, like, hey, how come you're not playing Injustice anymore or Street Fighter anymore? Or, or not Street Fighter, but, like, you know, Mortal Kombat. Whatever, yeah. Then they'll, like, just trash the game oh the game sucks blah 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 or man i ain't playing that trash or oh i am just moved on blah 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 like so they end up like just hurting the they end up trash talking the game ultimately i feel like some well not all of them but <clears throat> it's just they they you get the endorsement and then you you know it's fake because they don't even keep playing it so it's just like don't even, like why even like just do the song and dance then just give it to the people that are gonna actually endorse it and then they're gonna keep endorsing it throughout the life of the game like that's what it needs to evolve to like well Chris okay G, so- I like Chris G he's cool I mean I've I've met up with I've tested with him uh, I've been to so many tournaments the great guy he's, I I mean I I I I know he's got like beef and and crap but personally I've just never had a problem with him but. Yeah, like he doesn't. He's never going to endorse an NRS game. He's never going to be like, "Oh, that's great." Like he's always going to pretty much trash talk him. I feel well, like. so. I, I feel like a lot of times too, it's not so much the problem because, and this is where I kind of swing on the other side of the fence. I do believe that the general community is very, very harsh on people that aren't fanatics about the game. Now that is a lot of times passion talking because we all care about you know we care about this and we take it seriously, right? But, you know, as the FGC goes, a lot of times that the majority, so like when a Street Fighter tournament has like 2,000 people, right? The very large majority of the people that are entering it do it because they kind of like the game and may not really have aspirations of really doing well, but it's familiar and they like to play it and they like the characters and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. With this game... It is very, like, the way the style of the game is is very niche, and it may not have as wide an audience. So, like, Injustice, for example. Injustice 2 not has the un, the double kind of thing against it where it not only does it play the weird NRS way, but it also is a game that was just generally unpopular from the way it looked, from a lot of bad press in the past and stuff like that. So, it's it, they're, they're not popular games, but MK is definitely more popular than Injustice. But then the problem with MK is that I think a lot of times the community acts really weird about people that kind of just pick it up and play it and then stop playing it after a while. That's just a, a cyclical thing. It happens. People will, when a game first comes out, there's a lot of kind of a new toy uh, shine on it and they'll play it. And, you know, they, they, they either like it or they don't. But there really shouldn't be this sense of like, oh, well, you can only, you know, how dare you have an opinion about it if you only played it for two weeks and stuff like that. And it's just like, that's just how people are, you know, they'll make their, they'll play what they want. And if they don't like it, then that's it. They even may still like playing casually, but they don't want to pay money to enter a tournament for it. And I think sometimes you kind of have to just live with that. You know, that's just kind of how it is. Um, and I think sometimes that this community, especially some, you know, certain people 
in the past can be could be really really dumb about that kind of thing. Anyway, what's next? You not no response to that. I agree. Oh, thanks. Okay, well, that was easy. Yeah. Well, anyways, the summit will be happening sometime in the future. You can look for that. They'll, I think they, the they, point they, was made. Okay, fair enough. We, the points have been made. Um, that will be that is to be determined. The date of that we don't actually know that yet. Uh, but that'll be coming soon. So look out for that. Did you happen to catch ketchup and mustard uh, looking at some of the Brazilian play for MK11? Was that with the Killer Genot guy? Yes. I didn't. I did see some of that. Yeah. Yeah. So they had an event in Brazil uh, that was very similar to like the reveal event that we went to, and it is same build, but. This time, we had the added benefit of, since the reveal event, there's kind of been, you know, Ketchup and Mustard videos and things like that, where people, when they play it now, they get a bigger sense of what they're actually doing, Mm -hmm. just because we have a better... And so, those Brazil videos, if you watch them, are actually pretty interesting. Uh, There was one between... I don't know if it was Killer Jinnok. It may very well have been. Uh, But it was that that person and then another player, and they were playing, I think, Sub-Zero and Scorpion. And just the way they were playing is way more indicative of how I think it would go. They were using a lot more of the specials. Um, Sub-Zero, like, it was, like, it was just way more advanced than, you know, the kind of stuff that was at the reveal event where they only had, like, 45 minutes. Whereas these people really kind of looked like they had studied the videos that had come out and were trying to have those ideas played. I think there was a Gearus one, too, that was actually a really good showing of what Gearus could do. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really interesting. Like, we saw Sub-Zero, for example was just hit it for days would hit the overhead because he's got a really fast, low slide and string to complement it. Right. Which is exactly what I thought. And I thought it was weird that some people were saying that, oh, Sub-Zero is going to be reactable in the future. And no one, you know, he's going to be hard to open people up with. And it's like, well, no. Like, oh, so I, you could ever say that when you have a slide. <laughs> when you have that slide and you have a low string to an overhead to complement it. It's just weird. <laughs> and then we also saw Scorpion. They were using his... Um, He has, like, a weird kind of stance thing that he can do where he pulls a sword out and he has an overhead and a low from it. But I think it was was Killer Jinnok. He was using it to cancel it. You could cancel it. So he was doing, like, you know, back one, something four, cancel Mm -hmm. in the stance, and then go from there. And that was actually really hitting the guy a lot. So that was interesting. The other thing that he had was that he could um, do a combo and end in, like, this one where he powers up the spear. And then continue the combo and end it where he's going for a spear move now, and the spear does way more damage. That was interesting, too. So we got to see how those those custom variations kind of come into play with what they can do and how they kind of change the way that you play. Super interesting. Yeah, it was. Super interesting. Yeah, we saw Gearus. The Gearus player was really using... Um, he has a move where he'll... It's, it's not quite as extensive as the one where he goes back like four seconds in time. But what he does is basically does a move and then he reverses it. So if he does his forward one shoulder where he goes really far and you reverse it, he'll go back to where he started. So that he was using that a lot in pressure. He was using that like if he whiffed it, he'd go back. And he was baiting out attacks and punishing him for it. So that might, you know, that was a clue in how Gearus kind of maybe plays the mid range because his attacks don't have the best range. That's But that is pretty interesting. Yeah. Like he can start of kind of guess on moves that he's going to make. And if he's wrong, he'll pull it back. Maybe force a mistake that wouldn't have been there. Yeah. I, yeah, I wish they would let us know on, on the whole custom variation thing and what the tournament standard is going to be. Hopefully, yeah, they'll it let hasn't us been know. really clear. You know, we had when when the reveal event was going on, there was an interview that came out with Ed Boone where he had mentioned that they wanted to do incorporate all the moves that you see in the build in the reveal event build, but in preset variations that made sense for competitive play, which was his, you know, wording. Hmm. And then Paulo Garcia did an interview not too long, you know, around the same time where he said that, oh, we want it so that, you know, the custom variance will be a thing that we want to use going forward. And that is what, you know, we'll be adjusting in the future is the variations and maybe what's available. And maybe some characters will have more variants and maybe some won't. It was a more, it was a more vague answer. 
I wish they would just tell us what's going on. <laughs> Cause yeah, like we don't, that's, that would, I think that would just help with the hype. Like just tell us what you got in mind. Like what moves can we put together with what? And so we can start like thinking about it. Like, I don't know. It would just be nice. Just, it's, just, just, if you don't know, just say like, we have an idea of that we want to use this system. We're still incorporating it. We're still testing of uh, the standby, like just anything. But this whole, because there's no conversation of, of them saying like, Oh, the casual, we, we've noticed that the casuals love the, the custom moves in, in justice too. So we're putting it back in MK or in MK. There's like, they're not giving us any reason for the, the variation process to begin to be in there to begin with. And so it's just like, okay, well if it's back then in what fashion, because there's, there's two different types of things we're talking about here. There's the MKX variation system. And then you have, there's the injustice to customization. So it's just like, you know, they're not going to do, they're, they're not going to just rehash MKX because they're, NRS, they never really do the same thing twice. And you know they're not going to rehash Injustice 2 because they're NRS and they're not going to do the same thing twice. So you know they're going to be doing something. I just wish they would just let us know <laughs> what is going on. Well, I, I think there's a couple things here. So number one, I, I think my guess is this close to release, they know what they're going to do. They're just not saying anything. Right. Just, right. gosh, what is the I don't get it. But I, I would also say that since they've been so, because if you look at the combat cast, and they, they, they're very specific in how, the, what kind of language they use most of the time. Right, like they're so cryptic about it, and it's kind well, of the hype, I feel. Well, that's not what I was saying. I was saying specific. It, they don't say, they have never said as they, because in Justice 2 they were very clear, this is a gear move and this is not. Right, like were gear moves that big of a, a thing? Like they, that's the thing they've never openly said. Like the gear moves were a smash hit and injustice. Well, but to two, me, to and me, the casuals eat them up, ate them up for breakfast, so they're back, everyone. Like I don't, I don't think so. They're not ever saying they like for breakfast. they're not saying it's like for casuals, and they're not saying it's for competitive play so we no one really knows what's going on as well. well okay so for me the biggest clue is that they because again like i said in injustice 2 they were very clear this is a gear move that you have to equip exactly this is different than the what is their base move set and also here's my other here's my other thing oh so they they said that type of stuff in injustice 2 is what you're saying and when they would do the injustice 2 you know live streams they would always you know steve would say this is my loadout I've added this new gear move. And the gear move was your code to understand, oh, this is not in their base move set, so this is something you have to equip that won't be used. Because they made it very clear that gear moves were uh, not something that you were going to use in... You were going to use online, but you weren't going right. to be able to use in but they, so, they... That's the thing. They made it clear back then. Yeah, well... The, making the, it so, clear now. So the, my, then here's my thought, is that they haven't said it because... It, they they want to go forward with this custom variation thing, but the reason why they're being coy about it, I think, is because it hasn't just. It's just they want to incorporate all those moves. Like none, I think what they want to say is that none of the moves you're seeing are not going to be able to be used, but how they're breaking them up, or if they're breaking them up at all, that is the part that they they like. They don't want to say, oh, in this variation they do this because you know. They, they just haven't figured out, okay, how much points does it cost, you know, all this stuff. That, and that can all be tweaked, I'm sure, fairly easily. But I think they want to move forward with this custom variation thing. That's what it seems like is the end goal here. That's what it – right. It feels like they want to do it. Yeah. Like they, they had an Injustice 2. They just, and it just put it in. They were like, we're not exactly sure how to do this in tournament. It's, it's like a half idea. Let's put it in. Because uh, yeah, because I said if you look at what the base moves of most of the characters are, it's it's nothing. Scorpion has spear and teleport. That's it. He has to have. It has to be that you have to have some sort of custom variation, or because like uh, like for Sonya, for example, she doesn't have that many moves. So for me, it'd be very weird to be like, oh, there's variation where she just has a parry. Right. Well, that that's weird. 
Uh, or there's a variation where Scorpion just has, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of one of the, like the Flame Breath or whatever. Like, because that's what they did in MKX, but they seem to be going away from, like, oh, they only do this one thing and then that's it. Right. And Paulo was very specific also about how, like, well, it might not just be three variations and, you know, that kind of language. So to me, it does seem like they want to move forward with this customization thing. But I think the reason they haven't said anything is because they don't want you to get in the head of, like, what point values are and, oh, you can only use this move well, and for, it costs as much. It's, no, I think no matter what, that silence is, is going to hurt. Because it's like the more silent they are about it, it feels like the higher the expectation is going to be as to what they're planning. It's well, like, why the, other thing, just... the other thing I would say, and this might sound callous, but it's true, there are roughly 200 people that care. Care now, I should say. Um, and so those combat casts are not for us. And the, the, the kind of mind we're thinking of is it's not essentially for us there are some nods here and there but you know ultimately i think if they don't want to say anything yet it's because that they have an idea and it'll come at a later date because i I, some people are saying like oh it's going to be it's going to ship and it's you know it's it's not going to make any sense and that's why they haven't said anything it's like well no they obviously know don't be stupid why they haven't said anything i couldn't give you an answer but i tend to like the, like I said, from the past where they haven't clarified if this is oh this is a move you'll only be able to use on you know you'll only be able to use in your version online or whatever because they were very clear about what gear moves were. That, right to me is my clue of they actually do want all these moves you'll be able to use, but whether or not it's going to be custom or in the in the like three hard locked variants like they see. Did I'm already like or, thinking about like how many points is that move going to cost? How many right. points is that move? See, I'm already, I'm already there. Well, and, and already, we, I already have this expectation of what they have in mind and they haven't said anything. That's what's weird about it. So it's just like, if it just turns out to be like an MKX variation system, I'm going to be disappointed. If it's going to be the injustice Two like thing, I'm going to be disappointed. So it's just like, I don't know. I'd rather just, I don't know. But I think it, see that if it's a point thing, a point system thing, see, and now I'm getting into it, <laughs> like, <laughs> the balance issues are going to be, you know, this this move costs, like, two points, and this one costs three points, and then you're going to get people raging about, why does this move cost two points when it's so when it's not even that good, and why is this move one point, and this move's broken, and, man, that's going to be... <laughs> Oh my god, that's gonna be a blast, man. Yeah, I mean that'd be hilarious because then it'd be like, well, you know, the patch notes would be like, oh, you know, Gears's thing is now two. two well, slots. yeah. Do you be like, if, what the if, fuck? If a move is too powerful, do you buff how many points it's worth, or you do you? Or if if a move is is not good enough, do you buff how the powerful the move actually is? Or yeah, do you buff, do you the, buff slots? the properties, or you do you buff like the slots, like? Yeah. Like, because I know Gyrus's thing where he rewinds time for four seconds, that's three slots. Right. So that takes right. them all. So if you have that. So what if, you, like, you know, it's yeah. not actually that cheap and it's just like a gimmick, like, then you make it two slots and, but then you give him a, another special move and it makes it out of control. And, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> what a can of worms. But, I, like, I think you said, too, it's, 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 they, they never really tend to repeat themselves. But that's what makes it super fun, though. Oh, it's that's, it's definitely it's, way more fun. I agree. I think it's way more fun than just yeah. a canned like the designer just yeah. c- controls every aspect of everything. And I will tell you right away, the number one thing I don't think like I worry about is balance. Make sure it's fun first. We'll worry about that when it comes to it. Yeah. Obviously, there are people. And they're who getting. They get better at it every time. Too. They do. And so. the other thing is, I know everyone. You know, is very concerned with how much money they're going to make in tournaments. I understand that. I understand being tentative about that kind of thing, about balance and all this stuff. Hold your horses. It's probably going to be fine. I, if, you're pro- if you're a professional, you're going to pick the best character anyway. So who fucking cares? God, it's so fun in the beginning. It's it so is, fun, right? Yeah. Something's going to be busted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, naturally, like it's just gonna happen. Right, you know? right. It's you gonna be so funny to see. 
it's every game, it's every fighting game. Every time a new fighting game comes out, it's just like who's who's out of control. It's gonna be, but this is gonna be extra fun because it's gonna be what moves. It's not only gonna be what moves are busted. It's gonna be what combination is the best. That's what's gonna make this yeah. even more interesting. I think. God, if it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. That's awesome. I'm getting hyped for something that I not might not even be real. Yeah. (laughs) But that that to me is the fun of, you know, a game and pre release, you know. I'm partial to say that I do actually really like their their carny method of how they uh you know hype things up. I've always liked that. So I'm not that offended by it. I know some people are. It just builds anxiety. It does. I mean, it, I, I understand the anxiety 100% because, you know, it it totally makes sense to be anxious about it, especially if you have aspirations of competing in it. However, I do think that most of the time these things tend to work themselves out and they don't ship. I, it, the, the days of them shipping an absolute disaster are kind of gone, you know. This has happened in the past, I won't lie. You know, MK9, my God. <laughs> um, even Injustice and MKX had their problems when they came out. But Injustice 2, I would argue, just aside from the character balance, you know, it, it worked. You know, the whole product worked and had their, their vision for it worked out. And how the tournament mode the stuff worked out was good. I liked Injustice 2. I did too. So I, I just, I, I have a little more faith that it'll whatever you think it might be where it's like, oh, I don't get to use all these moves. Well, the fact that they haven't said, well, um, you know, you may I don't understand why moves. people were upset about the customization thing and just to like, they, cause they were straightforward about it. They said immediately like these will not. Well, be- I, I think, I think that was more of that. People didn't like that. Those moves, some of those moves looked really interesting and that you couldn't use them. I'm, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, but yeah, I think that was the only thing. Um, I, some of them were, and I mean, like, I think that was a more of a character specific. I, I appreciate that they set the expectation more than the fact that they weren't able to incorporate those moves in the tournament yeah. play. Like, well, I think some people were upset that they'd show like trailers for characters in Injustice, and they would use gear moves in the trailer. So your expectation, you know, was this, and then they do the combat. This is drive. the same thing. I'm not. I'm just explaining what the the beef is. <laughs> okay. I'm not saying it makes any goddamn sense. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing that like if you read TOM, nothing makes any fucking. I want to use that scorpion stance. That's cool. But I don't yeah. know if I can. It looks so cool. He he like props like he hits that little button where the the sword kind of pops out of the hilt just a little bit. Yeah. Oh my god. That's like a stance. That spear move where he like twirls it a bunch, that looks cool. Dude, I wanna know what moves I can use. I can't wait. My 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 safest guess is that if it is gonna be pre locked variations, none of the moves you've like seen a false are false hype inside of me. But hang on, hang on. My guess is that what they'll do the safest bet to me is that it's preset variations, but it will incorporate all of those moves. And then not, they're just going to be some like, oh, well, we're not using them in those. That is my guess. God, I wonder if there's like a, a super fun mode where you can <laughs> like make a, just a broken version of your character where it's like unlimited. Wouldn't that be fun? You that could would just, be fun. God, that would be so fun. You could just get all of your best moves and like try and put them together. I guess that would, you would run into notation problems then. Well, yeah, because I think some of them would overlap. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. But that would be sick. Well, maybe they could, I don't know, unlimited special moves, customization, and just see how broken you can make your character. Yeah. That, I mean, a lot of games that have the sort of customization like that end up having a mode like that. I think Guilty like, Gear has, a, has that. It's some of the older ones, they were uh, different versions, like yeah. gold versions or something like that, and they were, like, super busted. Yeah, I mean... And, well, they've had games, like, I know Street Fighter in the past has had, like, games where it's like, uh, oh, you can play as the, uh, you know, the, the 
champion edition version of your character. Oh, like, it, their that was wrote, like the 30th anniversary, or not 30th, yeah. I think it was 25th anniversary. Well, I think it was just called Anniversary. Anniversary, um, yeah. But yeah, you could do that. That was like, a really cool game. Yeah, like you could play as the World Warrior version of the character, which means they do a bunch of horse shit. Championship yeah, edition yeah. Balrog, or not Balrog, or Bison. And Bison, yeah. yeah, that was ridiculous. Yeah. So you could do stuff like that. You know, they did. They would do stuff like that. Or they had the Street Fighter Alpha Anniversary Collection had something like that, where you could play as the different versions of the characters. Right, right. Different That's patch the, versions, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like, again, this is all speculation, but... And I, I don't have a problem with people speculating, because it's all fun. But uh, the real, like, Hellfire and Brimstone, like, take a chill pill. Like, it'll be alright. Who do you think has the best uppercut in Mortal Kombat history? That's a good question. Because, well, because the uppercuts didn't really get distinct for a long time. Uh, they all kind of look the same. Man. But, I think Kung Lao Mortal Kombat 2 uppercut. Well, his did go, like, straight the hell up, right? His was, like, a thing of beauty. It was so smooth. It hit right above his head, and he left his arm up there to make the, the uh, hit activation. Like, even longer. Oh, man. What a great, great move. There was one that I actually really liked. And this was a more recent one. But in MKX, <clears throat> Shinox down to was like this palm lift. Like, he lifted up his palm and hit you with, like, the... the, the Wait, which one? Of, Shinnok and MKX. Like, oh, he his hit you with, like, was ridiculous. Yeah, he hit you with, like, the bottom of his palm. And it just, because it was such... pre yeah, was, Shinnok when it was mid... And safe, and like it was just like such a six frames. <laughs> and it, and it's such a <laughs> and he's hitting you with like his palm. It's such a bitch move, like <laughs> because that's what he is, you know. It, oh my god, that, that, that move funny. actually was pretty busted. Yeah, it was. I thought that was funny that he had a really goofy like uppercut that was insanely good. That was one of the best as far as properties go. Yeah, as far definitely. as like mid fast, pretty damn pretty pretty safe. I, so, I I would give yeah. a shout out to Mortal Kombat One Johnny Cage. That one looks. Oh really yeah, now I can th- yeah, now good. I can see it in my head. Yeah. He puts his whole body into it, like he twists. Yeah. Like you're just like, yeah. holy smokes! Like when he does that fatality, you believe it. Yeah. If any other character had done that fatality where they did the uppercut and their head flew off, wouldn't have the same impact as Johnny Cage's. I will say one thing I'll give props to MK2 about is that they really nailed, because, you know, the uppercut was the most powerful move for most characters. Did a ton of damage, the big knockdown, all that stuff. And in MK2, the noise that that it makes, like the crunch and the, like, the, oh, like the Uh sound they get made when they uppercut it, it sounds perfect. Yeah. Like that, wow, that move really hurt. And then the addition of of Dan Ford and Toasty. In MK2, it really just sort of all sold it there. Just like, wow, damn, that uppercut hurt. It was hard that. to top the Mortal Kombat 1 uppercut, and they, Mortal Kombat 2, at the very least, yeah. did it justice. Well, at I think the very in, least. They, and in Mortal Kombat 1, I think even then, they had like the excellent. Like they would have like, something, someone say something like, god damn. Man. Yeah, it's not like a whip crack. Like, right, man. Fuck, yeah. It was great. Sound yeah. effects are so good. And They're still good. good. Em- that's the, good that's, that's, that's I, I the... love that in this game that they cause a crushing blow if you counter hit with them. Mm-hmm. And because it, it should, like you see that uppercut, and it's like someone's jaw is broken. Or if you it's... if you duck a throw, I think it happens too. I think because a whiff throw, I think counts as a counter hit state. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, and it, it looks brutal. Like they get hit with that uppercut, and it's like jaws broken. You get a super huge cool. Combo. Yeah, super good. Yeah, but a good uppercut is necessary for MK, in my opinion. Things got to hurt. Yeah. Who else had a... Is there any... Who had the... Who in MK9 had the best one? Um, I would I'd say the ones that I can remember being extremely good were Sonya's. Oh, yeah. It hit Hers like an arc. so fast. It hit, and it hit like an arc around her head. Behind her, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think Johnny's was pretty good. Because his hit like straight, straight up. Right. So his, you know, was good if you're going over his head. I remember Liu Kang had a pretty good one. Um, who else? Some character, like, I know Rain got to use his down two in his combos. 
Yeah, his yeah. did a crap ton. So did Aramac. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, he got to Man, his, yeah, if Aramac hit it, the because he would swing all the way behind him too. If that yeah. hit behind his head and he got the reverse telekinetic slam, oh my god, yeah. that was good times. Yeah, I remember that. Um, Quan Chi was it was kind of like Johnny Cage's where yeah, it was right good. above his yeah, right above his head. So yeah, it was good. Okay. Yeah, good uppercut. I think Shang's was was bad because it was slow. I still remember his being particularly slow, and it just didn't come out very good. So his was like on the weaker end of who who has a good uppercut or not. But uh, I'm glad that the you know uppercut is still relevant in MK11 because it is normal. That is the move the casuals will go to and be like, I'm gonna hit the I'm gonna right. hit, I'm gonna hit the sweep. Iconic. I'm gonna hit the uppercut. So you gotta have both of them. The whole just sit, it's hold down and wait for them to get close and just hit two. Oh God, it's yes. so Mortal Kombat. I don't yeah, think there's anything that's more Mortal Kombat than that as far as game. If you're, yeah, if you're playing the arcade, you know you're waiting for them to walk up and throw you, so you fucking uppercut them. And then when you get to like the third person, they start counter throwing you out of your uppercut. Yeah, that's great. You just hate your life. Right. You start, the computer stops falling for the uppercut, and then you start doing sweeps. <laughs> <laughs> And then when that doesn't work, it just well I jump kicks, jump kicks. What the the? Because I I want to say in certain games you could trick the AI into like, okay, if I jump right here, they'd stop and they'd jump, and I could jump kick them back. But right. Other than that, I was fucked. Like they're counter throwing me out of all my punches. There's some thing with jump back. If you jump back and hit a kick or a punch, like just before you land, it causes a reaction out of the AI where they'll typically throw a projectile. I, I had I, I thought that was the case because I remember I was playing I have a main machine at home and I was playing MK2 with Scorpion and I remember if they were walking forward and I did a jump back at a certain point they'd stop and do a jump forward and every time they did that I'd spear them right right yeah and, and yeah really and MK out. yeah MK2 that's a big thing where if you especially with Scorpion yeah they just jump towards you for some random reason if you jump back at a certain space I see okay. free spear yeah and then. I remember, and this and this might just be the Super Nintendo version. I, I seem to remember the Super Nintendo version, for whatever reason, up to past Shang Tsung, no boss or no character will ever attempt to get out of the way of Reptile Spit. Really? Yeah, like I, on the Super Nintendo one, I remember as a kid, the exploit I would always do to get to Kintaro was just do the acid spit all the time, and they would never duck it or block it or anything. They'd always just get hit. That's funny. Yeah, so I could get to Kentaro easily enough, and then that was where you know my troubles began again because they stopped falling for that shit. I, I Shang Tsung or Shao Kahn has an exploit, I believe. Uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head where he doesn't like. I just, maybe like his shoulder hits high or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, well, in the Super Nintendo version, I remember using an exploit against Kentaro, where I would just force myself into the corner. I would let him teleport, and then if you held towards the center of the stage, mm -hmm. he would end up in the corner, and you would recover before him, and then you could stun lock him with high punch. Really? Yeah. I don't wow. think that works in the arcade, though, but I'm I'm almost positive it worked in the Super. That was how I used to beat Kentaro as a kid. And then in with Shao Kahn, it was pretty much put myself in the corner, uh, and hope that he would just shoulder, and I could uppercut as a punch. Right. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes he would just go hand with the kick <laughs> and the punch, and you yeah. just stun lock you until you're dead. I seem to remember that on the main machine, you can jump kick, and he'll block it every time. But like, if you were bored enough, you could just jump kick constantly, and he doesn't do anything to stop. Really? It. Yeah. Like he'll it's just a block long it until he fight, dies. Though. It is. Yeah. And I remember I was just. I want like, to be done. You with can't it, so screw I, up one time. It basically, yeah, and that's what and that's what I did. I was just like, all right, how long can I jump kick him until he won't? And he just didn't do anything. I was wow, like, oh my god. Oh, and I know in like MK1, I think with Goro, you can do like with Sub Zero, you can uppercut him, freeze him as he's getting up, and uppercut him again. Really? And, and yeah, I believe you can do that. Where huh. he's big enough to there that works, but I don't think it works on most other characters. Hmm. I always like finding the little exploits like that. You know, in those classic games. Because that was the point. I mean, you had those games were fucking cheap. And you had to figure out how to get around it. I just did that, um, 
this weekend. So I was playing Castlevania 1. Oh, wow. What a great know, game. A great game. But I was just getting bodied. Like, I played, I played it through straight and I got bodied. Like, it took me forever, like five hours or so to beat this fucking game. Hmm. And death, in particular, was like death amazing. is tough, dude. Yeah, <laughs> but I remembered, I I remembered that's the that hardest part in the game easily. I remembered that I had seen a speed run, and because I remember they could do it in like twelve minutes, right? I'm like, that's nuts. But I remember what they said was that the holy water is fucked up. Yeah. So I, I and then I remembered that with the way the holy water works, it stun locks enemies, and you can walk right past them. Because they're so locked in the stun of the holy water that you can't, they can't hurt you. So that hallway right before death, which if people don't know, I'll try to describe it as best I can. There are little Medusa heads that kind of go in a parab- parabolic kind of state through the whole thing. There's this guy who constantly walks backwards out of your range and throws an axe. It's like Injustice. Yeah, yeah it's basically playing Injustice 1. Each hit, <laughs> each hit does four points of life, and you can only get a hit like three times before you die. And right after that, you got the death fight, and there's no turkey. It's brutal. But when you have the holy water, the holy water on those axe guys, if you throw it at them, they stun lo- it kills them in one cycle and they get stun locked. So you can walk right through them as soon as they land on the holy water. So you only have to do that twice and you can easily dodge them. When there's nothing coming at you, you can dodge the Medusa heads really easily. And with death, the same thing. Because what happens is so, the reason why the death fight is so hard is because death appears and these scythes come up on the screen. And even if you destroy the size, five more will appear. And they're super hard to avoid, because you're very limited mobility-wise. Super hard. But, that little moment where death appears, if you throw a holy water on him, jump and whip, throw another holy water, he gets locked into place and he cannot move. And that's how you beat death. I remembered that, and now and then I beat the game in like an hour. I still, the, To me, the hard part was the first Dracula fight where I just get annoyed. Because he shoots those fireballs and it's like... It's like a timing thing. Yeah, because if you don't jump at the exact right time, he'll do the anti-air one. It's like a test of reaction. It is. And you only hit him in the head, so it's like... It's hard to kind of get hits on him. It's actually set perfectly for your reactions. That Yeah, that game gets a lot of flack for being way too hard. I I didn't feel that way. Like, I felt like... It's a fair hard. It is. Like, if you learn how to play the game and you learn how to, like, learn the range of your whip... And what the sub weapons do and all that stuff, you could clear it easily. Yeah, it's not, not easily, that hard. Yeah. yeah, how your jumps work, all that stuff. The Reaper stage is definitely the backbreaker for most people. That is, yeah, because it's bullshit. It's honestly, cheap. like, yeah, I that the hallway with the axe guys and the Medusa heads. That's a killer. Yeah, I I just went ham on that. I d- yeah. I just whipped like crazy. I would yeah. do a jump whip. I would always do it. Start off with a jump whip against the axe guy. Well, the thing is with the Medusa heads, there's a timing to them. There is, yeah. And so if you understand the timing of it, you know when you have to worry about a Medusa head versus you know when you have to worry about the the. It's like you, you I, once you play it, you kind of just get a feel for it. Is all you it do, is. yeah, yeah. It's super fun. What a great game! I love the first Castlevania. It's, yeah, it's one of my favorite games. It's very, very good. And I playing it again, I was like, wow, this is really good. Yeah, the music's good. Music's good. Death is. I always used to cross against death. Well, so the the thing that's fucked up. So the holy water is really good. But there's only one holy water drop. It's at yeah, the very it, beginning of yeah, the stage. If you miss that in the very beginning with the holy water. Or you die. You're fucked. Yeah, because if you die, you lose a sub weapon. Yeah. The cross is more of just like mono e mono type. Yeah, the, well, the cross drop is so if you lose at death or in the death hallway, you get reset to the final room before the hallway. That room has a cross drop. And the cross is a very good weapon. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's not bad, but you want the holy water because it's so broke. And naturally, when they put those in Smash Brothers, they feel as good as they should be. Yeah. Yeah, I love it in Smash. The cross is so cheap. Right. And it should be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you don't play classic games, get into those. Those are good. Don't believe the what you heard. They're fun. Well, some of them are. Like, I would, like, Metal Gear 1 is, like, annoying. But Castlevania is good. The old platformers are good. Some of them are great, yeah. Some yeah. of them, some of them are like music, you know? Music. Like when you like, like the Beatles, like and 
hold your hand. And I like, do like the Beatles. Yeah. Like some some games are just nailed it. There's a feeling to it that just not all games can capture, and that one captures it. Yeah, Castlevania well, definitely captures it. Well, the nice thing about Castlevania is at least it has fucking continues. Unlimited continues, so you yeah. can't really complain about like, oh, I died and then I got to restart yeah. from the very beginning. So, and, and I would say it has the nicest like, okay, you get to Dracula, you'll be stuck there. Yeah, that's true. It never true. goes past the Dracula staircase, which that's, is like, the yeah. roughest. Is probably uh, like the Frankenstein and the Grim Reaper stage. Those two are like. When you die and like you got to continue oh, and start God, those, yeah. those stages over, those are the, like the a Frankenstein stage. The Frankenstein stage sucks because, sorry, folks, I know this is a Mortal Kombat podcast, but fuck you guys. Sorry, I love you. <laughs> might have to edit this out. Take that one back now. Yeah. Um the the Frankenstein one is because you want holy water because again it makes the fight incredibly easy, but the only holy water drop is very early in that fucked up stage where you have to go like a long like, corridor kind of thing, where these eagles drop these little demon guys, and it's super annoying. Fleeman? Yeah, and, yeah, exactly, and they and they jump. They're right. very hard to whip. And then if you get past that, if you die at Frankenstein, you reset back at the beginning of that hallway, and the only drop you get is a, is a dagger. Right. Which isn't helpful. That's really tough to beat him with that. Yeah. It's almost irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, that there is some where it's just like, I might as well just game over, because... Just it'd be easier to try the whole stage again than to do this again. So, uh, and also like Castlevania, like the way you get pushed back when you hit, it seems like it was done very specifically to be as annoying as possible. Right. Because you get hit on like you're, while you're jumping, and it's like, well, I died because you know I've jumped back on the wrong way and missed that platform by an inch. Or when you're I'd, trying to I'd go up, the big, to, I'd say the big designer troll on that one is going down steps. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> how many I can't count how many times I went to go up or down stairs and I just immediately fall straight down and die because I was like yeah. I wasn't paying attention to hold up right. specifically. Yeah. That That's, is and you can't move or do anything. Like as you're going up you can't do anything. Done, yeah. yeah. Don't go on think, steps unless the enemies are dead. Yeah. Or unless you're going down to another screen for sure and you're not right. you know, you're not gonna worry about anything. How did good. we get it on this? Um, we'll have to put was, this at the end of the podcast. We were talking about um, <laughs> old games having exploits. Oh yeah, like Mortal oh Kombat, yeah, uh, AI exploits and stuff. AI exploits, yeah. right? Because that used to be the name of the game. I mean, that was the hard part. Was or the hard part was figuring out what you could do to manipulate the game, and from there you kind of got a mastery of it. But it was still tough to maintain, like Pac Man and stuff like that. It's just, and Donkey Kong, it's the grind of doing it a million times. Mm -hmm. Not, like, because at a certain point, I think Donkey Kong is like, what, four or five stages? You you know what to do. Can you keep doing it to keep earning points over time? That's the hard part. Mm -hmm. And those, a lot of those older games are built like that. It's kind of a fun thing. Like, you're, you're trying to cheat the game, basically. It's like a magic trick, almost. The more you play it, the more you start to notice the nuances and the patterns. Exactly. Like, I remember, I used to think Super Ghouls and Ghosts was just this impossible game that you could never Right. Beat. The more but, you play it, though, the more you yeah, know. You're like, damn, I didn't think about this. Or, like, I know the big one I was playing, because I didn't play a lot as a kid, was when I got my Super Nintendo Classic, I played uh, Contra 3, Super Contra. Oh, great game. A great game. And... I didn't realize it until I just kind of stumbled upon it that if you kind of keep flipping between your weapons and holding the fire button, you get a very constant rate of fire from any weapon that you have. Yeah, it's that it's kills the lag or the recovery of it. Yeah, it's cheap. And so once you do that, it starts to really become easy to get through some of those stages. The hard part then becomes, all right, can I keep my wits about me as I'm getting surrounded by a bunch of stuff? I'm telling you, man, those old games, they had some magic in them. It's its not... It's still there, but they're it's music. cheating the AI. I think they're going to be like music. I think they're going to be just like... The yeah. the video game... Uh, what, what do they say it's going to like burst? Or so the video game industry bubble. will burst. The video game bubble. The video game bubble. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think that'll happen anytime soon. Well, I think, I think it's because... I think, yeah, I ahead, think like some games will just always be there. Like Mario Brothers One, Mario Brothers Three, like yeah. some games, it's just they touch a they touch like a frequency in our brain 
a certain something. Just like well, I, what, yeah. just like a song, like just like a song. Like you're just like, God, oh, this is just beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think a lot of people misunderstand what happened in the eighties as to why there was a burst on them. It's because Atari was making these proclamations about their sales that they had no way of matching. They just were they thought they were king shit and would be forever. And they made some projections and they were off badly with and they they made some bad games. They made Pac Man port that was bad and ET and a bunch of other stuff. All those combined combined with ridiculous projections for your future put them in the ground. There's so many companies now that make so much goddamn money from this stuff. Like if so if Nintendo tomorrow was like we're closing up shop. People would be devastated, but you know what? Rockstar is big enough, you know, industry. EA, Activision, all that stuff. It's if Nintendo goes it's fine. Back then if you were the only game in town and you win, that was it. That was it. And you were the console maker and you were the only console maker. Now Sony and Microsoft are not going to go under, guys. Yeah, I yeah. I think it would be the opposite. I think th- there would be so many games and there's so much to play that people just stop buying games as much as an oversaturation of the Yes, market. an oversaturation. I of see that happening over before anything else. Yes, actually, definitely. And then that, that's when like people cuz the like the more realistic games get the more it's just there's this less gameplay and it's more of an experience than a challenge. Whereas games used to be more of a challenge than an experience. Right. And well, no, and I think there, there's, there's going to be yeah. like, what were the best games that provided a, a great challenge? And the class, some of the classics are always going to be like mentioned in that category. Yeah. Well, there's, and there's good and bad things to that. Like, I, I definitely think, there are a lot of people who like maybe like one type of game and they'd like to play it through, but it's just it was it's just brutal, right? And you can, like say if you really like Castlevania, you want to play the first one. That game's fucking brutal, man. Right? Like people can't even clear the hair second. on your chest. It will. You can't even clear the second stage, right? Like for example, when Mega Man X, they released Mega Man X Anniversary Collections for the Switch and PS4 and stuff, and there was a mode on there that lets you basically you know, tank hits and, you know, it makes it way easier. It's a mode that you have to turn on and it's only if you want to, but I think, and and not, and Mega Man X games like are, are, they're not like Castlevania. They're a little way easier to get through. Yeah. Mega Man X six is like, is probably the hardest one. But other than that, you could get through these games. They're not very hard, but there's just people that, you know, just aren't that good at them. And if they want to turn on the mode, that's fine. I think sometimes the problem though, where you talk about the games as experience kind of thing is that, a lot of times the only way to kick it more to a player who maybe wants a bit more of a challenge is that they just bump the AI up to incredibly unfair levels. Like, if you want to play, like, expert mode on some FPS game, it's barely even fair. There's nothing to exploit. Like, it's just they're too good. Mm-hmm. And that's and it's not fun to play. Like, I, I remember the Uncharted games, it was kind of like that, where, yeah, those games are real, you know, cinematic heavy and it's voice acted really well and all that stuff. But if you wanted it to be harder... It got so hard to the point it's not even fair. Like, they don't do the checkpoints very good. All that stuff. Yeah, they weren't designed to be that hard. So, they weren't, yeah. So you don't even bother playing that. Right. Yeah. The, the nice thing about those older games is a lot of them were designed around the era where arcades were still... They big, were so designed they had, to be hard, and they, in most of them, they you could actually beat. They were just you could. Hard. Yeah, they were designed to be hard, money. and the yeah. designers designed exploits to get around the hardness of it. Right. Like, have you ever played the, the Castlevania that came out in arcades? It's called, like, Vampire Killer or whatever. Right. Like, I played that at GGA. That's insanely hard. Right. Like, that's way harder than Castlevania 1. Right. So I'm sure they toned it down. Right. Like, okay, how do we make a game that's, you know, more... Acceptable? Yeah, arcade games are out of control. The, the Another good example is the MSX Metal Gear, the original Metal Gear. The, the uh, enemies will chase you from screen to screen. But they made it in the NES one. They were like, okay, that might be too bullshit. So if you can clear the screen, the enemy soldiers will not follow you to the next screen. Right. And it's just maybe it's a bit of an easier exploit, sure. But it makes more sense if you're going to spend more time on the game. Yeah. You think Nintendo, if you think Nintendo has hard games, just check out the arcade, just arcade games. Oh, my God. Like the, the original Ghosts and Goblins? Holy shit. Right. Like, it was way, it's totally different. It's totally different. It is. 
Um, it's a bygone era, but it's a fun era to play with, and especially when you watch like those like you know summer games done quick, you know awesome games done quick, where these guys are just experts at it and can clear it and talk you through it. It's I, I saw a guy on Twitch; he was one lifing battle toads. Jeez, like, on, the, reg- battle on toads? the regular, I was like, oh my god, dude. Ugh. It was ridiculous. I just I watched the I watched him do the whole thing. I was like, "You gotta be kidding me!" Yeah, that's that's ridiculous. Yeah, I love when people like were able to break and exploit those games. Like those are so fun. Like some dude from Brazil or something. Like that's like all he did <laughs> was play Battletoads. <laughs> and he figured out just by process of elimination. Okay, this is the best way. His to do friends it in Brazil were like, "Dude, you need to stream." Is that how Brazilians talk? <laughs> it sounded a little more Russian, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like I'm too Dave. <laughs> <sighs> oh, jeez. Um, classic games, man. If you have an arcade near you, go check them out. Get an NES Classic or whatever. Good stuff. I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm... I'm yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's why we like fighting games, because, you know, it's, it is, fighting games is sort of a process of breaking down what's extremely good, and basically cheating your way to, I mean, not cheating, but like... Exploiting your way. Exploiting. I mean, it is exploitation, like, some of the shit is not fair, but how to counter that is kind of the fun of it, so I think, you know, that kind of is, I, I assume that's why I like them so much, I maybe the same for you, I'm not sure. I remember during Injustice 1... The AI was like so cheap. They 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 were like, is the AI too cheap? Like everyone try and beat the AI on the hardest difficulty, and so like everyone was trying to beat it. And like, uh, I was the first. I was I was the first to beat the, the super hard AI because I think someone like had, had had like bugged it or something like that. They were like, the AI is impossible. <laughs> so everyone was like, someone's gotta, who's gonna be, who's gonna prove him wrong? It's funny. I did well, some, I, think- I did some exploit. I think it was with Superman, but I can't remember what it was. It was great. I think, wasn't it Injustice 1 the first time where they really, like, oh no, it was guys- Killer Frost. She had an exploit. Mm. Mm. It was like, uh, I remember now actually, which is pretty pathetic. It was like slide, and then they would block the slide because the slide was so cheap. And then you right. down one slide again. Oh, and get them every time. Yeah, like the down one, they would get hit by, and or maybe I can't remember. For some reason, slide down one slide just like always hit. It was great. Was it? Wasn't Injustice One the one where the guys worked really hard on the AI to make it like? this is how the guys in the lab play and it's more accurate to how it might play out at high level. I remember they were talking about that. Like it was a big deal. I don't remember MK nine's AI being as hard as that. No, like I think injustice was like specifically yeah, they made it so like super, super like you can put the AI on super diff- high difficulty with a, even now, even with their newer games and kind of get an idea of how that character is supposed to play. <laughs> what kind of combos they do. Yeah, like, you'll see, you're like, whoa, damn, like, like, I hadn't even thought about that. More than one occasion, I'd be like, what the hell do I do with this character? And then I would put them on, like, super hard AI difficulty, and I'm, and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> 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 That's what you do. I remember, it was actually during that story I just told about, like, that AI thing, and then Justice 1, is how I learned how Deathstroke works. Really? Because I started playing against, you know, Deathstroke super hard AI. And as soon as I did anything besides ducking, like if I tried to walk back or forward, instant low guns. It like mm. it was immediately read that I was not blocking low and instant low guns. Now I was like, and it was super fast. So I was like, God, that is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> now I was like, so that, I was like, that's how he plays. I was like, you low gun. Everyone to death, so they stop moving, and that Bogans increases your mobility and forces them to jump. And then you, and the, yeah, I would try and jump, and then he would high gun. And I was like, wow, AI there just go death stroke. Yeah, that's the game. <laughs> that's awesome. I, uh, yeah, I mean, 
their AI at NRS is really, I think it's a step above a lot of the other ones. Like it just feels um, like more indicative of what the character should do than the other ones, which are just, you know, like the old school, just super hard on purpose. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about that stuff. Probably bored everyone off, but a few diehards. So I think it's a good time to wrap the show up as it were. Uh, as usual, we can be now found on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, maybe in the future. I have to work on that one. I haven't really gotten figured out how that one works. But there is an RSS feed link on our Podbean website that I will link to when I post this on Twitter. That will help, you know, get it back on your phone so you can listen to it without turning your phone on, which is what everyone asked for. And it seems like it's been going over pretty well. We had a lot of downloads last week, so I appreciate everyone that listened. I know I said fuck you guys earlier. I didn't actually mean that. I love every single one of you that listens to this tripe. Uh, <laughs> Slips, you got anything? I'm done. I'm done. He's tapped out. He's had his monster. He's on his crash route right yep. now. Well, that's going to do it for us, so we'll come to you back in two weeks' time. We'll have had another combat cast by then. Maybe some more info to talk about. Who knows what will happen in the future. I got an idea for a fun segment with Slips that I think he's going to look forward to in the future. Uh, maybe we'll do that as soon as next episode. Maybe some other time in the future. Who knows? But until then, signing off. It's King Hippo. This is Slips. See you guys later. Peace.